But let's jump into the next topic, and we're going to welcome in patron Bill. It's been a long time since we've had Bill on, and we are very glad to have him back. He's bringing the spice as well uh, in the pre-interview uh, segment. We are talking about the Philadelphia 76ers and how Bill thinks the process has failed and how it's ruined the NBA. And if the pre-interview has been any, uh, at least, indication of what this topic's going to be, it is going to be a fun time. Bill, we are so glad to have you back on. Guys, how you doing? It's been a little bit of a hiatus, but I'm glad to be back. I was lost, but apparently not forgotten. No, <laughs> no. never forgotten. <laughs> Definitely not forgotten, and we're 100% throwing Ricky under the bus for that one. So congratulations, Ricky. I <laughs> buy that. That's acceptable. Uh, we're going to make sure it's more consistent, though. But let's jump into the uh, the process talk. Uh, I love that you're throwing this out there because obviously they're making moves. Now we, you know, once they trade for Jimmy Butler, we're saying the process is completed. completed. Um, but that doesn't mean it's been successful, at least. And you are coming with the advantage point of not only has the process itself failed for Philadelphia, but at least it's bad for the NBA and it, it's a bad look for the NBA. So why don't you expl- uh, explain your feelings a little bit before, uh, you know, Philly fans jump on your throat. Well, again, and this is nothing against the fans of Philadelphia or anything like that. It's just a knock on the the league and how, like, the way I look at it is you weren't just, you're not just bad because players didn't resign with you. You missed out a few draft picks and, and whatnot and then just decided to go another route. Like, you purposefully lost and said to your fan base that you're going to lose in a league where this isn't an athletic, athletics is competition and you're saying you're going to purposefully lose just so that you could get draft picks and be better later. Well, for one, that strategy doesn't necessarily, that's not a strategy that, that is meant for like winning. It's not always going to work out that way because you can miss on draft picks, but you're, you're basically telling a sect of people like, yeah, we're, we're going to take your money and we're not going to try, but trust us. But tr- like think of it as, as the government with taxes, we're going to take your money. Just trust us, you know, and then they screw you over. Well, that's, I feel like that's what, the Sixers did to NBA fans. It's like, yeah, we'll take your money. We'll, you know, and Sixers fans, we'll take your money and, you know, pay ourselves, pay the players, but uh, you know, we're just going to lose on purpose. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. So I just, I just think it's, it's, it's a slight to the league. The, the first thought I have, though, is to throw this uh, at you just so you can defend it a little bit. Um, I, I kind of at least like the fact that they were at least going to you know, be honest that they were rebuilding. Um, maybe branding it as the process was the wrong move, but they were rebuilding. We see that right now. Um, and you being a Bulls fan, obviously right now the Bulls are rebuilding. So how do you see that as a difference between what the Sixers were doing uh, and obviously the, the, the process they're still in compared to what the Bulls are doing. How is it different and, and you know what makes that a little bit better? Because right now the Bulls are still you know leading the league in, in, in attendance right now. They're still selling out the United Center even though they're not putting out a great product. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Um, I And my response to that would be, I guess, you know, the Bulls have been making terrible front office decisions, which is, you know, partially the reason as to we're losing, but we're not – the, the six percent office basically said that we're going to go out there and try to lose. We're going to go out there and try to lose on purpose for the specific strategy of getting higher draft picks. And I feel that that is just, it's just a slight to the, like you're, you're a professional sports team and you're going to lose on purpose. And I think it's just, it's, it's disrespectful to the league and for what competition, is. you know, I understand trying to rebuild and trading away players to get future assets. Um, but purpose to say we're, we're, we're going to lose, like we, even if we have a bad team and we win some games, like, no, we don't want to do that. We want to lose those games. It's, it doesn't, it just doesn't sit right with me for somebody who pays for a product that you want to see unadulterated. We're going to bring Dave in here now just because I, I think that Bill makes a very good point, at least separating the difference between those two. And you can look at it as, you know, Sixers fans, when they were told what the process was going to be, they knew up front what the ideas were, where now Bulls fans can look at it in the hire of Jim Boiling, Boylan, they can just say, all right, Garpax is horrible. They're making terrible moves. Maybe if we make a change there, this is going to, you know, change as a franchise where you look at Philadelphia – if you change the front office, well, this is the front office plan. And if they're losing, that was their goal all along. So you can't really fire them for doing what they were hired to do. So looking at this, do you see the difference? And then what do you think at least about has the process ruined the NBA or at least was it a bad look for the NBA? Right. So to your first point of – actually, no. Second point. Has it ruined the NBA? <laughs> I'll go with it, it, it has forever changed the NBA because I think that teams going forward – 
are being publicly called out by not only other uh, franchise owners, but also the front office and also the media. Like there, there's such a level of uh, we've seen this happen before. We're not going to let it happen again. We're not okay with that. And it's funny because fan bases were around the league outside of Philadelphia were mainly upset with this. They felt like mm-hmm. they were being cheated out of it. Like, you know, the, the, you know, we talk about NBA purgatory that just, you're not good enough to make the playoffs. You're not bad enough to get a top pick. And those teams stick around in that range for quite a long time. Sometimes they can't pull in some free agencies or really develop a lot of great players. So I think there's a lot of frustration built up around that. And by the Sixers basically putting out a product of, we're going to move anybody who has value, who's not, you know, going to be a franchise changing product for us. And they're going to go get us future picks. Whatever the value is, they're gone. Not going to worry about that. I mean, the amount of people they moved through the doors in Philadelphia was ridiculous over that uh, four-year span. I just think that it comes down to at least the Bulls are trying to use the guys they've Mm -hmm. got and see if they have long-term value. Where I felt like the 76ers, it was always an open showcase for talent for another team. I mean, the first thing I'll piggyback onto that is, number one, we literally changed the draft rules yes. because of the process. Yes. Like, now we have the top three teams get the same odds because of odds. the process. It's not great odds. But, like, even I'm looking at, I think, the same article you have up yep. of just the timeline of the process. I heard Rachel Nichols this week put it perfectly with the process. Is It wasn't just, hey, let's tank for picks. It was trade every asset we have. Like, I'm looking at some of these players. Drew Holiday. He's contributing on a Pelicans team. Could have contributed He's a two-way all-star for the most of the time. Yeah, like, but that's what I'm saying. Like, he can contribute. Thaddeus Young, a guy who contributes on that Pacers team that he's on now. Like, they got Danny Granger when they traded in the Evan Danny Turner. Granger was broken. But that wait, point. they waved him right away. Like, yes, Danny Granger could have broken. No, he couldn't have done anything. But at what that point I'm saying in his career, is, he was dead. they're like <laughs> even Evan Turner, Thaddeus Young, Drew Holiday, all these guys. Just trade them to get picks. And it wasn't just like, hey, we're going to target these picks. It was get a ton of picks, first, mm-hmm. second. And it's basically let's throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. Well, yeah. and, and that's and, what it is. And even to that point, too, I know now retrospectively it is a good move. Uh, you look at the Michael Carter-Williams deal. I mean, mm-hmm. he was rookie of the year, mm-hmm. and then they end up moving him right away. And again, obviously retrospective, great deal because he obviously you know never lived up to that season again. Um, <laughs> they tried to do the same thing with Ja. Yeah, they tried to do the same <laughs> thing with uh, Okafor as well. Um but you know, you you didn't see that whole commitment to talent. Where at least with the Bulls, you see them re-signing Zach Levine mm-hmm. and, and you know, uh, uh, matching that offer from Not Sacramento. Not just re-signing, matching. Like no, it wasn't just said that. No, but I'm just, like I just <laughs> wanted to like yeah. hammer that Emphasize. home. It wasn't like, hey, we're gonna offer this. It was, yeah, you know what? We really want you, so we're gonna match a like what many fans were like, holy crap, why are we overpaying him? Yeah, and thank God he's played well. Yeah, and I, I think that you at least see, you know, and most of the other young players uh, have at least, you know, put in, uh, you know, still in their rookie year deals. But then I mean, we talked a little bit before, uh, you know, Bill came on about the Jabari deal and, you know, the mm-hmm. fact that they went out and, you know, tried to at least make a move for him, uh, giving him $20 million, uh, 40 overall, but they obviously have the team option next year and they're just going to end up waving him. Uh, they're at least trying to get assets that they can use. And no one's really going to take on a $20 million contract from Jabari Parker even if he's playing well because of his injury history. So that was more of, well, let's see if you can be a Chicago Bull mm-hmm. rather than let's bring you in for you to be an asset. Um, but, Bill, at least focusing now on how the process has changed and at least come to the modern-day 76ers, do you think it's a positive sign for teams that might want to dip their toe into the process? Because they do have three All-Stars. They have Jimmy Butler, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid. Do you think that's a positive sign of the process? Or, since you're saying it failed, uh, just because they have that talent, they're not going to win a title this year or possibly next year as well. Um, do you think that's the reason why it fails? Like, when now looking at where the process has kind of ended, um, what do you think NBA teams are taking away from it? I think if they're smart, they're looking at, at, at the total process as, no, not a, not a good move, not a good thing to do. Like, how, how long is the process? Maybe seven or eight years? Uh, you got 2010 to 2013 was the first year. Pretty much mm-hmm. when they traded Igudala, that was, like, the big year. So uh, about eight years now, yeah. Mm-hmm. About eight, yeah, like about eight eight years, and and so you got, and, and so they, I mean, as we just talked about, they traded away a bunch of assets, this and that, Michael Carter Williams. But okay, so at the end of the eight years of the process, you have Joel Embiid, who is great, but we'll see how long he lasts in the NBA. You got Ben Simmons, who's got a lot of cool, 
a young young guy, a lot of promise. Can't hit the broad side of a barn, but um, you have two players. You have two players, and then you acquire Jimmy Butler in a trade, and I don't see any way in hell that Jimmy, Jimmy Butler stays unless they give him the five-year 190. Mm-hmm. Um, you, can't, you can't turn away. I mean, you'd be stupid to turn away that money. Um, okay, so you have those three guys, and, not, and literally nothing else. No, literally nothing else. I mean, like JJ Redick. Okay, we'll see if he's around next year and, and what they can pay him. But if if anybody thinks the process was successful, you all right. So over those eight years, you got three good players and nothing else. Yeah, I think some people might argue the fact of just Markel's potential still makes him valuable, but you still even look Zaire at that. Zaire Smith as well. Uh, Zaire Smith as well. I mean, like, like the play, the most of their draft draft picks no. outside of Simmons and, and Embiid have not panned out. Like, didn't Zaire Smith like, almost die or something? He did. Uh, he he did. lost 20 pounds due to a, uh, infect no, an uh, allergic it was reaction. Allergy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. They, they haven't been able to at least hit on their draft picks, although they, they accumulated so many uh, draft picks. And you even look at, you know, the 76 or the Celtics, actually. It's kind of like they did the process a little bit better because they've been, <laughs> you know, a better team. And they have more draft picks still ready and loaded to trade for, you know, an Anthony Davis, possibly. Um but I, I still think, it, uh, you know, at least the process, like they were able to turn it into something. I mean, you look at the New York Knicks; they're not able to turn, you know, that whole team. I mean, since I was alive, they made the playoffs. I think once. Mm-hmm. Um, they haven't been able to do anything with their rebuilding or, or their stars. So, I mean, they have at least been able to show that if you tear it down all the way and build it back up, you can get back to the playoffs. And this is now a team that's fourth in the Eastern Conference. Uh, do you just want to throw out there, Philadelphia? Probably the technically the, the the process started in 2013 mm-hmm. when they hired Brett, Brett Brown and went uh, 19 and well, 63 but they weren't good the prior year as well but uh Bill just going back to you um do you think that you know this was at least the smartest way to rebuild for them because again we don't see the typical way of rebuilding working out every time for most of these teams and and I again I got to say no for for a multitude of reasons though for reasons other than just trying to hit on draft picks and hit like I mean there's some you guys talk about bus all the time on, on, on your podcast. And I mean, that happens. And the thing is though, you're purposefully trying to lose. You're trading away. Like, like you said, we traded away Drew holiday. Yeah. To get assets, but it's, you're literally purposefully trying to lose. So you're not only you're, you're sliding fans. You're, it, it's almost like, I mean, I guess if, if the fans know that they're purposely trying to lose, they want to pay for the tickets. It's not like stealing. Cause they're, they're, you know, paying the tickets anyway. Cause, and, and they know, but cause they're public about it, but, you're purposefully trying to lose and not build a winning culture. You have to find a way to build a winning culture and to make players want to be there, want to stay, want to be part of the process, not be like, oh, I'm just some guy who's going to get flipped for whomever. And, like, I mean, the, the Philadelphia 76ers remind me of, like, a 2K rebuild where you have, like, a rebuilding challenge, mm-hmm. and they just start trading people and future picks and all this, and it's like, that's cool in video games, but if, if a front office tried to do it that way, like, the Celtics had a winning culture and they had – they had players around that they kept around to mentor young players and to try to win games. And the fact that the Sixers purposely didn't want to do that, uh, what, what is it? What is the what is the saying when you get like fouled and you don't think it was a foul and they go to shoot the free throw? And they may like ball don't lie when they shoot mm-hmm. the free throw. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, it's like the the higher powers of it looking down. Like yeah, you're going to try to lose on purpose. Well, you're going to get Jaleel Okafor, you're going to get Markel Fultz, and you're going to get. Maryland's Noel as your as your top picks. Like you, there you go. Because it's it's the integrity of what it entails. I guess is what bothers me about it, and that the league is okay with them openly saying we're going to lose. Because it's I I don't know. It's just it. I just think it's it's not it's not professional. That's not what you know. But they, they did they did what they did. They thought it would work, and from I. It's been eight years of the process. They're the fourth seed in the East, and they haven't been into the second round of the playoffs. And you know, so I guess the way I look at it is, let's give, let's give them two more years. Do I think in two years, so a ten total year run? Do I think in two more years that the Philadelphia Sixers, Seventy Sixers, will be anywhere past the second round of the playoffs? I think the answer is absolutely not. Well, and the thing that I want to, the thing I like that you mentioned was the building a culture because. Before I get into that, the one thing I do want to say is this shows that, like, drafting is a science, and it's not an exact science. Like, for example, look at the Phoenix Suns, Z's team, where, what, in the past five years, they've been in the top five four of the or four of the last six years, they've had a top five pick. And it's like and they, where are they now? They're still at the bottom, going to probably have mm-hmm. another top five pick. And the thing I like with Bill mentioning culture is 
I look at teams like, and yet again, think about what I just said. Drafting's not an exact science, so it's not like you can say, do what this team did and you can get in. But, like, I look at teams that have drafted their talent, and the two I look at, the one is the Warriors. Like, yeah, they, yeah, they got lucky. They got, even before Kevin Durant, like, no. Steph Curry becoming who he is, Clay Thompson, like, they hit on their draft picks and they developed into what they are today. But but I think there was also luck in those draft yeah, picks, just because like bit. you look at Steph but Curry. I mean, two 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 point guards went before him. That's drafting too. Is drafting is all luck? Yes, but but yeah. again, like you you look at Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Like Philadelphia has had their choice now. Yeah. Uh, what? The, hold on. Philadelphia's had their full, like their true choice, their true mm-hmm. number one choice two times now with Markel Fultz mm-hmm. and uh, you know Ben Simmons. They had the options of picking any yeah. player. They ended up going with that. They're one for two. But you look at, you know, you know the Steph Curry year, you know, Steph was arguably the most productive player. He's more mm-hmm. productive than Johnny Flynn, and he just ends up falling because of the injury, you know, the injury that he had uh, with his ankles. And then you look at the Clay Thompson thing. Clay had some troubles in college as well. That's why he fell to 11. So I just want to throw out that there was some luck with the Warriors. And stuff. that's why, for me, the, the reason why I was going to cut you off is they're not even the team I really want to use. Okay. I want to use Denver. They're a team that has been using their draft picks, getting the guys that they want, and I feel like they – are built. They've built a culture to where it's like, hey, we've drafted the guys that we wanted, developed the guys that we wanted, and this year they're taking that next step. And it's funny that a team like the Nuggets didn't do something like the process. They're competing in a tough Western Conference. The Sixers go through the process. They've got Ben Simmons. They got Joe. They trade for Jimmy Butler, yet... The Raptors are better than them. The Bucks are better than them. The I would say the Celtics in a seven game series are better than them. It's like there are so many teams in an Eastern Conference that are better than the Sixers that it's like in the end I wonder if like what Bill said when we get two years down the line, are we going to be looking at it and going, wow, that was a failed experiment? Well, I, I think it's it depends on what means the process succeeded. I think it means NBA Finals. Um, and I don't know if they're there yet in the next two years. But we are at least seeing Philadelphia now push back a little bit on the process because mm-hmm. at least since 2013, I've, I would say that Philadelphia fans have been probably like 60 percent uh, of fans have been fine <laughs> with the process because you know now they're back in the playoffs. They just you know over uh, overachieved last year, getting 50 wins. That yep. was a huge success for the process. Now they have three All Stars and Jimmy Butler, Ben Simmons. And, and Joel Embiid, but they also have it at the best of luck. I mean, even look with the Colangelo stuff as well. They were trying to build the culture in that front office, and they weren't able to do so because he was just a, an erratic personality that apparently needed to, you know, get his thoughts out um, under under different names or whatever the whole the tweet situation was. Um, and then you look at the and now you look at that coach. I mean, they've been trying to build that 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 uh, culture with Brett Brown. He's been there since 2013, and now you kind of see Philadelphia fans turning on him. So we haven't seen that culture kind of you know, at least be developed yet because they haven't had those consistent players that have been there. And then also you look at the head coach. Is the head coach the, the right guy at least? And I think that's what most of Philadelphia is wondering. It's funny you bring up the uh, consistency of players because they moved their guys that basically had grown up through the process mm-hmm. in Robert Covington, a G League guy who was picked up by the Mavs initially. And like he did his time, he grew, he developed, and he became like one of the best 3 and D wings in the NBA. He was what we were hoping for. As far as like that's your role player, that's the glue guy on a team mm-hmm. that you know puts them over the top when they've got their stars. He's the guy who gets it done night in night out. He's your Luol Deng. Yep, he gets moved. Yeah. Dario Sarch, same thing. It was like mm-hmm. he was a first round pick during the process. Yes, we were hyped about him. You know when he came over, it was oh this guy's he's a big, he's got a soft touch, he can shoot pretty well. Lost a couple of years and nope, he's out of town. So like Jeremy Grant, another one developed and then he keeps developing now on another team, but. They had those guys there, and they're all gone. I think that's sort of where it feels like, like you said, the the culture has sort of been like raked over a little bit uh, because of that constant turnover. But I, I think it is funny that, you know, what I applaud the Sixers for doing was keeping Brett Brown around to keep that one vision, one voice uh, maintained amongst the players because it's when you see it with the constant turnover of coaches a la Phoenix, it's just like, one year they're doing this. The next year, what are we doing? I don't know. We've got a different head coach. And the next year, I don't know. We've got a different head coach. And it's just like, you can't build on anything. It feels like every year you're just starting over again almost. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I do applaud them for that. And whether Brett Brown is or isn't going to be able to take them to a championship, uh, that that's a different question for a different day. But I think with, as far as the process goes, like you said, 
I think Ricky nailed it as far as you're just trying to get as many tickets to the lottery as possible. Mm-hmm. And if this pans out for them with Markel Zaire, um, obviously, like if one of those two guys can hit, then then it's really looking good for me. And I, I'm struggling to say like, is it what what in, in what context would a failure be if mm-hmm. in two or three years if they don't win a championship but they're you know a a Eastern Conference Finals I, team? Well, huh, I think gonna, championship I'm, is the bar. I'm gonna go to Bill real quick just because he wanted to jump mm-hmm. in at least one. It's not like he wanted to jump in when I, I brought up the idea of what makes the process successful, and this is kind of uh, what Dave yeah. is kind of pushing towards. So, Bill, you're saying that it, it's failed so far. Um, what does it need to do to be successful mm-hmm. in your mind? Uh, what do you think for those in this next two-year gap that you're giving them, or at least you know two and a half if we're counting this year? Uh, in this next two and a year, year gap, what do the Sixers need to do to at least kind of prove that the process was worth it? Uh, I, I guess with the the way you frame that, in my mind, nothing like you. Yeah, oh. be, no, no, no. Well, and, and I'll and I'll explain right, because. You lost on purpose. You traded away your whole team to get Jimmy Butler, who is now riding the asses of players that are in that locker room as well. I mean, according to reports, but mm-hmm. you you traded away your whole team. You don't you don't have you have PJ McConnell as a point guard. You got JJ Redick, and then the three stars. I'd even consider Ben Simmons a half a star because he, he's got to learn how to shoot. But um, no, I mean, no disrespect to him. He's a great player, but you they can't. You you tried to lose on purpose. It's been since 2010. You haven't been able to get out of the first round of the playoffs. Um, did they make it to the second round last year? No. Was, was it a second round exit? It was or? a second round exit. They lost mm-hmm. to uh, Boston in, uh, was it five or four? Right, right. Um, yeah. Like you, you, you lost on purpose. You slighted the NBA. You, you took the integrity of what the league is supposed to be and kind of, you know, for arguments like wiped your ass with it. And you gave away assets just to try to get these superstar number one overall picks and, and, and in my mind be greedy with it. We we try to lose on purpose to get, let's say, three number one overall picks in a row and build a team that way. Well just look like they're even saying that Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid have reports that they don't get along together because it's it's Embiid's team, Embiid's Embiid City. Look at all those egos. If you want three number one draft picks, you're gonna deal with three number one overall egos. Look at the and, and I'll bring up the Warriors is that that's Stephen Curry, Clay Thompson, um, Draymond Green, a second round pick, a, a, a tenth or eleventh overall pick, a sixth overall pick, you know, and they gelled together as a team and they learned their roles. If you want to get all those number one overall picks, sweet, you have three LeBron Jameses on your team. Which one is going to be the one who runs the team and who's going to follow in line? There is no order. There is no pecking order. You know what I mean? And it's not like a bunch of NBA veterans got together and made a big three and understood we're going to have to make sacrifices, yada yada yada, this and that. They're all there to make a paycheck. I mean, Boston's dealing with this now in an inadvertent way in a, in a, in a more they did very smart front office work to get all these young assets, but they're dealing with kind of the same issue as these guys want to get paid. They want to make their contract. They, you know, they're young and they want to make their presence known in this league. What do you expect when you're going to lose on purpose and get the biggest talents, the biggest egos? And, and not, not that that's a bad thing, but throw three number one overall picks in a row on the same team. Whose team is it? Who backs down first, and and so I just don't think that's good for Cal. I, I think and there's I, nothing that they can do to to absolve this. They should just start running the franchise the way that the way that and then somebody with integrity would. Yeah, I think the point that you hit that I, I do like. Um, maybe it was the at least oversight, Ricky, um, mm-hmm. for the process was putting a big three together. Because you look at Miami, well, that came together naturally. You look at mm-hmm. Boston, that came together naturally. You look at Golden State, that came... None of these were natural. They were all well, moves well, in. No, no, no I'm saying, I'm saying like, this is something that was like, hey, Miami was, let, these three guys want to come together. Mm-hmm. That was oh, a okay. natural oh, draw, okay. drawn to. You look at Boston, these were three veterans that... All were, well, were were just like one piece away of pushing together and being a great team, and they all knew that their goal was to win a championship, um, and they were at that point in their career to win that championship. In Golden State, they were drafted mm-hmm. together, but well, like Bill made a great point, it was the exact, draft pick positions, and that's exactly where I wanted to start. Is look at I'm going to use two pair of players, mm-hmm. Steph and Clay, Michael and Scotty, where it, both of those Steph and Michael are the guy. And there's even, like, I heard this week, I think it was on the jump or it might have been on the herd, where you look at Scottie Pippen. He never wanted to be the guy. He was fine being in Michael's shadow. Let Michael be the head of the team. 
I can just go out there and ball. I don't have to, like, Michael's going to be the one to answer questions. Everyone's going to want to talk to Michael. I can just go out there and ball. And then Michael leaves after 98. That next season, guess what? Scotty's got to do more than just ball. And well, he didn't like it. 93, and then it, too. 94, yeah, 95. Well, I mean, they, I mean the, team the real thing the same level. where it happened was after mm-hmm. Michael retired the second time. Then he goes to, like, his next team. Same thing. Then he goes to, like, Portland. Same thing. And I feel the same with the Warriors, where Steph's the guy. Steph is the one that can be the poster. Clay can just go out there and ball. And with the Sixers, Bill hit it right on the head. Ben wants to be the guy. Joe wants to be the guy. Jimmy wants to be the guy. Hell, there's even rumors, not rumors, more of opinions of, like, oh, could the Sixers end up trading Jimmy Butler before the deadline to try to get something from him? Like, Mm -hmm. we're even, like, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about on a team that wants to win a championship? Because, like, I don't agree with Bill where there's going, like, if they win a championship, the process is successful. But that's the bar to me. If you come anything short of that, then you failed because that's every other team's goal that didn't do the process. Well, Dave, as the <laughs> resident sister fan on the podcast, I think you should at least bring some positivity. Like, because well, Jake's not here to defend him. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be the standing <laughs> well, Jake. What's the counter to at least Ricky and, and and Bill's points, where Bill's saying, you know, the process is, has been a failure because it's you know it's lacks integrity. Um, Ricky obviously saying that you know mo- I would probably say that most likely Philadelphia is not going to win a championship at least in the next two years. Um, so that means he's saying it's failed. What would you say that at least the counterpoint is to saying it hasn't failed or it's not a failure yet? I would say that you guys are still criticizing their two best players who are on rookie contracts. Uh, They've got two more first-round picks in the lottery that they haven't even seen play very much. I mean, Zaire Smith obviously nearly died, and Markel got to see a smidge here, smidge there, but like... If his medical uh, issue is resolved. One thing, Joe is not on his rookie deal anymore. The extension kicked in this year. Ah, fair enough. Uh, One on rookie deal and one just off of it. Uh, Point being, it's too early to say. It's absolutely too early to say. The whole point of the process, admittedly, was to go get stars. That is what they've done. They have three stars on their team. That is what the process had the point for. As far as integrity goes, they didn't have any. I don't think anyone cared um, in that front office. The whole point was... What would you rather do? We were a team that sat in the middle of the NBA for how long? And we couldn't get over the hump. We couldn't get over the hump. Guess what? Nobody wants to come here in free agency during the current, during the current time period, uh, early two thousand or late 2000s uh, mm-hmm. into the 2010s. And they were just stuck. And how do you get unstuck? You start moving pieces and you start rebuilding. And they went the most effective way they could. And something that we hadn't seen the NBA for I don't think that anyone should penalize them for taking advantage of the system that was in place. The system was broke. They took advantage of it. You're saying don't hit the player, hit the game. Damn right I am. I think that the uh, the biggest criticism for you know their the, the qualifier for saying, well, they haven't won a championship is, okay, well, who's over 25 on that team other than Jimmy Butler who's actually going to be playing there? J.J. Redick is the only guy, and he mm-hmm. may leave next year because there's going to be more money out there unless he really loved playing there. Yeah, so. and I think, Bill, the best way at least we can wrap this up is do you think the NBA, at least since the process has started, has done enough to at least kind of combat teams and push them away from you know doing another process thing with at least changing the lottery odds and, and some of the other uh, measurements they have taken to um, kind of counteract uh, uh, tanking at least? Um, just, so, just so I could you, – you said, you said has the NBA done enough to prevent the like purposeful – is that, is that how you – yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So, be, so has the NBA done enough, in your opinion, to at least push teams away from you know doing another process? Uh, I, I, I think they, I think they recognize, I think they recognize the issue. I think the NBA recognizes the issue. I think they want to combat the issue, and I don't think they have done enough because I think that, no pun intended, I think it's a process to figure out, you know, what kind of ways you can prevent teams from purposefully like for doing exactly what the Sixers did. Um, I don't think you could fix that in one year because you have to see trends and you have to, you don't want to make a bunch of rule changes and then, you know, over, you know, overcompensate in that way and just completely mess up the league. But um, I think they've taken some steps in the right direction, but I don't think it's the way I look at, I think that the lottery should be held for all the teams. I think if all, for all the teams that don't make the playoffs, Every team has the same odds to get every pick. Ooh. And it's, 
it's ro- it's rolled out there, and that's so, and that will eliminate the teams who are the, like, you know, obviously Victor Odiva got hurt, but the Indiana Pacers are the world who are right there, right on the cusp. You know, that that'll eliminate. You know, when they were bad a few years ago, but they were on the, you know, maybe seventh, eighth, ninth pick overall. Like it'll eliminate those teams from being stuck, from being that stuck franchise because at any time that you don't make the playoffs, you can get any pick, and you could be the team that just missed out. And you get the number one overall pick, and, and wow, like that could completely change your franchise. So I think it would add a little bit more integrity to the game. And just, you know, just because you're in the bottom five, don't stop trying, building a winning culture, because I think at the end of the day, it'll make the overall league better if everybody's always trying to win. People will get better. People want to play on the floor. People will, or players will want to get better. They'll want to be on the floor. They won't want to be sitting losing. And I think the fans will get way more enjoyment out of it. And, you know, think about back when the Bulls got the number one overall pick with Derrick Rose. Like that, obviously, the injuries that der- that completely derailed what we had going there. But you know, we were I think had like the second to third least amount of odds to get it, and we mm-hmm. got, and, and so the Bulls were on that cusp of we're kind of bad, but we're not, but we're not terrible, and we got lucky and got that number one overall pick. Imagine if every team had the same odds to get that. There'd be so all the franchisers who are trying to do it the right way by building winning cultures signing players and, and getting people to want to come there. Anybody can get the superstar at any time is what that says. So, and I think that's, I think would be, I don't think there's a 100% fix to it, but I think that's the best. I think that would be the best way to roll it out and to get the best competition and the best product out of it. Yeah. And we have seen that before uh, when the Knicks won the lottery, uh, that was the the way they did it. They just threw all 14 teams into the the, the hopper. Obviously, everyone's seen You're the stir, the, the frozen envelope. envelope. Yeah, the Patrick Ewing, the frozen envelope thing. Yep. Uh, that was the uh, the way the lottery happened until 1989, until they went to the weighted lottery system in 1990. Uh, they also then uh, switched. I think uh, in like 87, they modified it to just uh, it was the first three picks were determined by the lottery, and then it was flipped. So maybe you do at least. I I, I kind of like the idea of at least possibly talking about um, the first three picks are. You know, determined by every team has the same odds, and in the the the, the first like the, the fourteen teams that don't yeah the four, the fourteen teams that don't make the uh, the uh, the 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 what's it called the four, don't make the playoffs Pops, they yeah. they get into put in the lottery for the top three and then it goes reverse order because that way even if you are the worst team you still don't get screwed you still get a top five pick um, but then again I think we'll see how at least this year goes and, and with the change of the the weighted system uh, how that ends up turning out. Uh, Ricky, what are your thoughts, at least, on the... Has the NBA done enough? I mean, I'm just thinking, and this is a draft thing in general, because, like, I'm thinking of the different drafts. Baseball is obviously different because, I mean, yeah, if sometimes, like, you pick a top five guy, top ten guy, mm-hmm. like, depending on who it is. Like, Chris Bryant, when the Cubs drafted him, we knew he wasn't going to be in the minors for long. Like, he was there to get that extra year, and then he was going to be in the majors. But usually... You draft someone, they're going to be in the minors for some time. You've got hockey, which has a lottery system just like the NBA, but then you have the NFL, which doesn't have a lottery system at all. And I almost wonder, I'm looking at NFL to NBA, is it because of the type of games where the NBA can't do what the NFL does because it's easier to throw a game in the NBA because of how individual, like individual stars are highlighted more in the NBA compared to the NFL. Also, there's only 16 games. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you could be a team that's still bad relatively, but yeah. still win eight games and still go to the playoffs. And that's more important yeah. to a team than getting the number overall. Meanwhile, pick. you can't put out, you know, a full roster of G-leaguers onto the field in the NFL. Yeah. You, you just mm-hmm. can't. Yeah. So, you get ma- you well, get there is, yeah, And there's, like, there is no G-league well, um, for NFL. Yeah, but, so like, you couldn't, put, you couldn't put out, like, yeah. third stringers uh, yeah. for, mm-hmm. you know, the entire third and fourth quarter to lose every game. Alouettes under the NFL. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and you can hire Mark Trustman to be your coach. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, we'll go to uh, Bill. Uh, final thoughts on on your, your your process. I do love the tenacity and the uh, the, the fire you brought to uh, the, the, this topic. It's been a fun time. Yeah, I, I, I just think that it's something, and the, and the reason I'm very passionate about it is because it's it's the integrity of the game. Where we I want to see the best players out there competing to be better, and by purposefully losing, it it doesn't it it strips it strips the league of that and nothing against Sixers fans I kind of feel bad for them that their front office did this it's, I mean I'm a Bulls fan. I, like like I said I, I think the Bulls front office is playing Russian roulette with a fully loaded weapon you know no empty chambers in that and just completely <laughs> in the head. 
But so I see it for Sixers fans, but I, I don't. The, the way that to, to be proud or happy that your team is doing that, the, that doing that in that way, well, you you got served with Jimmy Butler. Great. You have Jimmy Butler is probably going to walk away and leave you with a star who can't shoot and another star who's probably going to, you know, maybe be out of the league by the time he's 32 or at least be a shell of himself at that point because of the way he plays in his body. I mean, it. I, I'm glad that it turned out this way. I, I think that the process is – I don't think that Philadelphia 76ers win a championship in the next five years. Okay, that, that's a 15-year window. I don't think a championship comes. I don't even think they sniff the finals. And I'm glad it's going to work out that way, not to slight Sixers fans, but so that other teams don't try to do that and so that it keeps the integrity of the game a little bit. Hey, I will say that when the Bulls had Hoiberg, I knew we were tanking, but at least it was fun to watch games. You just never had the playoffs of them. Yeah, I know. That was the first. That was our even young, like last that was our year, team. it was fun. Like Dave even said it when we fired him. He goes, man, watching Boylan lose isn't fun. At least Fred had fun out there. Seriously, Boylan's <laughs> got to be the worst coach to have. With a young team. Uh, but no, I, my final kind of thought on this is, you know, there's no one set uh, blueprint to get a team to a championship in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Like, we're in such a volatile time with free agency, the amount of power given to the players, that I don't think that there's any guarantee that doing uh, or trying to recreate the process again will get you two, three all-stars and the same hope even mm-hmm. to where they are right now, where they've got a ton of potential and if they can grow, they're really dangerous. I mean, you look at the top teams in the league. The Bucks hit on literally two picks, and the rest of them have been moved in from the uh, by the front office. The Raptors, homegrown talent, mm-hmm. front office move, put them over the top. Pacers, front office move, one piece of homegrown talent. Uh, 76ers, absolutely covered. Celtics, they just fucked the Nets. Like, <laughs> I just nailed it. Uh <laughs> The Nets have done an awesome job. Like, they are doing it on both ends. They're hitting their draft picks, and their front office is killing it for them. So, like, gold star to that team. They're, they're my, like, favorite underdog team. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go look at the West, though, same thing. Warriors was, you hit, on, you hit on talent, but it was the fact that they brought in the veterans, like Andre Iguodala and Sean mm-hmm. Livingston. That, David Lee. David Lee. Andrew Bogut. Mm-hmm. Like, those are the guys who were the like bones. They they were the structure of well, the, that early franchise. They even took the vet minimum on Demarcus Cousins. Exactly. What a smart move. Exactly. <laughs> How could you pass that up? <laughs> Didn't even know it was an option. <laughs> Nuggets had a little bit of homegrown talent, and they're, they're taking opportunities when they can. Obviously, the whole Nurkic situation uh, worked out to get a great backup center. The and, one thing with the Nuggets I want to yeah. throw out there. So originally, in I think it was 2017, they drafted Donovan Mitchell. Could you imagine if they had him instead of uh, Tyler Lydon? Because that's who they. Uh, that, I it was, that was the pick that swapped for. Uh, I thought it was Trey Lyles. Then no, it was Tyler Lydon. It wasn't Trey Lyles. I thought Trey Lyles was moved yeah, in that pick. Yeah, it was, it was Trey. Yeah, it was Trey. Yeah. yeah, but still, I was like, if they had Donovan Mitchell, that'd be pretty cool. But that was oh, yeah. besides the point. Uh, Thunder, they've got homegrown talent, but they also went out and got down the front office mm-hmm. to bring in uh, free agents and make trades. Trailblazers, homegrown, and then one trade to bring in Nurkic. Rockets completely front office. Uh, Clint Capella being the exception, but that was a long term, like low risk, uh, high reward kind of pick. So I, I just look at the top teams in the NBA. It's you can't do it just doing one thing. So I think that the NBA, yes, I, I like your chaos theory, Bill. I think that's absolutely fantastic. If you don't make the uh, NBA playoffs, you're entered in for either like Sean said, top three, maybe top five picks. Mm, uh, just number one overall. Down. Uh, no, no, no. I want it wider. Okay. I want it wider. I want to see some of these just miss playoff teams end up with some incredible talent. Because I'm with you. I think that I think that would help the game, and I think that would help the balance. Uh, because I last year watching the Mavs, guess what? Got fined because their owner came out and said, "Yeah, we're not winning games. We want a better pick." Mm-hmm. I mean, the lineups they were putting out there were absolutely garbage. Like G League, straight up G League lineups. The Bulls. I mean, come I mean, on. or you could be the this Thunder. Year, have terrible. Durant, Westbrook, and Harden, and lose two of them like you could draft again, three of those players had, and then they've had amazing lose them to drafts. free agency they've had amazing draft talent so now i think there's no one blueprint but you know this th- we're taking steps in the right direction yeah and we'll see what the nba does because i mean it, obviously you know i don't think anyone te- team is technically tanking right now because you look at new york and i don't know if they're technically tanking i mean they're trying out players but i mean i think cleveland lot- might be well in- cleveland just indirectly. lost the greatest player in my yeah. generation so and then it's- kevin love their backup is you know, all star yeah, got so hurt. I don't think they're technically it's the LeBron, tanking. It's the LeBron. I mean, the Suns sort of you want to question the tanking. They they refuse <laughs> to pick up a point guard. <laughs> yeah, but also they have they they had a horrible front office move. 
That's oh, just an, yeah. an aptitude they're, because they they're terrible all they, over. they hired a guy with no experience who just got out of the league, yep. and they fired who I thought was one of the better young uh, GMs in in the, in the, uh, the NBA and Ryan McDonough. Uh, anyways. That's going to do it on the uh, process. I know 76ers fans are most likely going to love it, even though Bill threw out so many disclaimers about it's not the fans. Uh, Bill, you'll get to learn that he's it doesn't matter. He's fighting for the fans' <laughs> fate. He wants yeah. them to get the best product. Well, it doesn't matter. You, I mean, you you said that you you, you like Memphis. You want them to have a good, oh great God. team. Go back and then, uh, to the beginning of the season. People, we got like two kill yourself comments. Yeah, so, uh, that's rough. Bill, I do want to say uh, thank you for coming on. I do want to say also thank you for uh, the uh, passion you brought because that was a, a very fun uh, 42 minutes, and we appreciate you being a patron. 